we begin with a breath to honor the breath that has been taken away. We honor the stars, we honor the sky, we honor the sun. We honor all living entities of the world. We honor the earth, we honor the soil, we honor the wind, the soil, we honor we the honor fresh waters. We honor all ancestral spirits that sit at the foot of the world, and we humbly acknowledge our indebtedness to the ancestors and stewards of this land, who we know to be the Willow Sammamish people. When we do so, we are not simply giving tribute to people who no longer live here. Rather, we are asking permission and invitation by those co-presences who live on this land and whose ancestral energies are at work here with us now, that they continue to be present with us, that they allow us to do our work with humility, with kindness, with generosity, with care. We call on them so that we may attune to and resonate with their existence. I'd like to especially give honor to the ancestor Kenny Moses, who Dakota let me know earlier this morning, was a cultural and spiritual worker for the Sammamish. We acknowledge our indebtedness to all more than human life, all the forces and energies of this land. We pay respect, we praise the waterways, we praise the salmon, the birds, the trees, the soil. We have to be aware that in this moment, living in this highly militarized society, we automatically think of resistance and power in terms of violence, in terms of domination and submission. Our liberation is not simply going to happen with fists and bullets. We have to understand that we are in this moment in a battle of the psyche. And that battle is going to be won on the terrain of spirits. Battle happens as we fortify our communities by transforming the poetics of our relations on this earth, la tierra, la piedras. We must change how we relate to each other and to the world.
I believe the headdress is made in China. <laughs> Most of the, the rest of the outfit is uh, assembled either in China or in Mexico. Um, and, um, and I wore this outfit in public. As an indigenous person, the stereotype plays such a huge role in forcing everybody's perception of our identity onto us. And in this situation, as a native person, I am, I am beholding myself as the stereotype for other people, which immediately changes the definition of what you're looking at. Um, not because I'm a willing participant, but because I'm wielding it as a tool, as a weapon, as a piece that acts as a social mirror. Because when I turn on the cameras, when I turn on video, and I begin to document the way people interact with me, as I did here, um, you begin to see what sort of what sort of presence we have, and so comes the power of existence within space. Um, and the performance art aspect, um, as well as installation, I believe, are two things that. Uh, allow us to exist in spaces. And immediately upon our existence in these spaces should come the questions that come along with that. What am I looking at? Why is this here? Who is this? What does it mean? Does it align with what I believe and what I see and what I believe is true? All of which, to me, is predicated upon the fact that every single thing you think you know about indigenous people is false. And in the case of the last American Indian on Earth, in order for me to create something that is comprehensive to the American and Western mind, I have to use those falsehoods to represent existence in space and time in order to engage people in a way and in a language that they understand, even though that language is not true, which is the struggle of our existence. The struggle of our existence is that we have to live your lie in order for us to talk about our truths, which immediately muddies our truth. And so this is the great struggle. It is my hope that, that this type of work, this conscious work, because we are prominent and able to speak in a language that you understand. And because of that conscious understanding of that language, that, that gives us power to move forward and change the narrative so that it is more appropriate for where we are and where you should be with us. So this is a piece called Squeeze. This is, I think, the only time I've physically put myself into a performance. Um, it was for the Bellwethers, um, um, sorry, the Bellevue Art Museum's Bellwether Art Experience Festival. And um, throughout this exhibition, in its multiple locations, I essentially pretended to be a worker employed by, let's say, market forces or um, kind of like big corporations. And we went around acquiring things acquiring trees, acquiring water, um, drinking fountains, spaces where people put their bicycles, spaces that you might sit. I installed these variety of price tags and um, somewhat arbitrarily assigned values to each, claiming them from, from the public, and then uh, artificially auctioning them off to the highest bidder. And so throughout this exhibition, I'll go to the ne next slide, um, I, I installed them all throughout the city and then made, made several loops over the span of about two weeks, um, continuously escalating the prices, um, as well as um, our keeping things sold. Fun, fun side story on this, this bench, I just found this is such a strange part of this project. Um, for the most part, people would, some, some people would feel comfortable talking to me, some people wouldn't. Um, some people would demand to know what I was doing, um, to which point I told them they had to speak to my supervisor and they had lost interest. But while installing this piece on the bench, um, there, there, I was told that I could, I, I had to go through kind of a rigorous process with the city for permission on what things I was and was not allowed to price. And I was told that I was allowed to price a bench, but only one that didn't have a memorial plaque on them, because they didn't want me to be pricing a memorial. Um, 
they also informed me that they weren't allowed to do that. They were all bad for selling off these benches. Um, and so like, I found like, one bench in the whole park that wasn't marked, and as I went through pricing it, people kept asking me if they could buy it. Um, they're like, ooh, is, are you auctioning off like, the nameplate for this bench? And at those prices, I should have said yes, uh, but I was just, uh, it was just a, kind of a generally baffling experience. Uh, but it was, it was an interesting piece. They were up for about, about, about two weeks, and the idea was, was that it was constantly changing and constantly escalating and working with this idea of who has the right to decide that they can take other people's property uh, or take the public property. And then tie them into arbitrary um, capitalist assignments. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a piece called the Post Human Archive, and it was created as the educational contemplation space for the Double Exposure Exhibition, um, which was at the Seattle Art Museum. Um, that exhibition paired the work with Edward S. Curtis uh, with three contemporary Native artists. Um, Edward Curtis was funded by J.P. Morgan and uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, to create a project that was tied to social Darwinism. Um, he went around uh, with the purpose of documenting the last of the Native Americans, what he dubbed the vanishing race. However, rather than being a historic document, they're often very distorted images. He would carry trunks with him where he would dress people in regalia from other tribes if he didn't think that they looked Indian enough on their own. He would uh, have people move uh, vehicles or uh, move away from light posts. He would edit his photographs to take out any evidence of modern devices. And the purpose of this was to frame Native American people as incompatible with a modern industrialized future. And now it's often looked back to as this historic document, which it's not. And so I wanted to make a conversation about that. And so I thought, if I were going to be, if I were going to kind of push this forward to now today, who might be willing to do that? And so uh, as you enter the space, I'm not going to say Siri, but her voice would come on and say, Welcome to the Post Human Archive Historical Preservation Project brought to you by the Ch Children of the Singularity and the AI Center for Ethnography. Our mission is to record the final examples of biological human life and save our posterity. We are so excited to document you, a prime example of a real life human being in our archives. If anyone's going to follow us, it's probably going to be um, artificial intelligence. However, uh, the assertion that biological life is just no longer going to survive is a pretty bold one. Next slide. Rather than being put, photographed by an ethnographer, people were invited to take selfies. I had two backdrop settings, which also referenced the way that Edward Curtis would bring fake backdrops, which he would pin up, so that it looked like people were maybe in, in caves or in different types of locations. Um, we have the cubicle, where I imagine our culture artificial intelligence might think we live. Um, and then a uh, pastoral backdrop which shows a blue, can't get to the blue skies, but you can see the vast industry pumping toxins into the air. So it's kind of giving us an idea of how, how we might be becoming near our end. And so as people document themselves, they then went into the archive. The archive was a near replica of the Library of Congress including its dehumanizing categorization of people by, by types, by profile, by things that they're wearing, or arbitrary assignments of what role they might have. And so, and I also looked at um, Edward Curtis's um, catalog, so the uh, Indians of stone houses, and the humans of glass offices, um, and kind of created this um, uh, pair parody of, of those argumentations. So once people put their images in, uh, we then captured them from the internet or anything that was public, um, and then um, they had no say in how they were how they were depicted, and there was no process to to correct any assumptions I may have made about them, whether they were single or a CEO's daughter, etc. Wow, it's really uh, I'm supposed to say it's really wonderful to be uh, a gathering with. You know, everyone will set up so many different approaches. I think that's really uh, shines a lot of light on the strength of indigenous performance at this moment. Um, 
this is my book. I have about four copies. It's called Blues Divine. So uh, these texts are, were an honor part of the Casino Project. I'd like to share some of them with you. Um, another part of telling these stories, I read something the other day that said that for every $10,000 more that your family makes, you have an X amount more likelihood of being an artist. So the art world is very class bound. Poor people don't get very many chances to be artists. So I grew up with my lesbian mom on welfare, getting evicted and, and living in uh, SRO hotel rooms sometimes. And the young people I grew up with didn't have opportunities to be artists. And I don't know why I'm an artist, except I would say my grandmother was an artist. She came from Alaska, having been taken from her culture, having been taken from the soulful aspect of her own culture, and found soul in black music. And she shared that with me. So I uh, combined that with some poetry. So I'll read this poem. It's called Grace. Grace, these don't over me because I live in music. And you can find me there in the discordance and confusion of everyday life. I'm there in between a blue note and a new note. You can keep that picture there. That's my grandmother. I'm there. Grace, ease on over me, see me and fall all over my everything, for there is nothing you cannot stand or understand. I can rest easy. I trust myself in your hand, because I know you love me. You always loved me. Through the bitterest seasons when rhyme left me stranded, you walked with me full of feeling and spoke in total silence. I swear, Aretha Franklin has saved my life more times than I can count. And if Billy sent me sometimes to the 57th floor, why she always find a way to sink me down. I could glide down easy on Charlie Parker with strings and find myself in April in Paris. Chestnuts and glasses. April in Paris. And somehow at those moments, nothing else mattered. At those moments, nothing that is not music can touch me. Spirit swathes me like impervious aura, and I understand what keeps me living. You see, it's the sheer goddamn funky swing of it all, the mystery at the heart of it, and at the end of the road. I understand why now I played that record so much, songs to torch by. Now, torture is not a widely known about thing anymore, but those folks knew they knew how to get a misery out of here before it became fatal. Why just roll yourself in it and let the tears and rage flow out? Let Billy carry that cross for you. She already died for your sins, don't you know? So when I get the lowdown of miseries, I reach for the tried and true soldiers of survival, and they come singing and moaning and falling out and getting up and Exhibiting so much class and grace and style till after some time, I feel my soul stretching and straightening up, filling my living frame, and I once again rejoin the human race. Music is my mistress, and she and I will never part. That image there is called I Cover the Waterfront. It was exhibited as a triptych as part of the casino project. Thank you. I believe that there needs to be a greater sense of quality and not commodification of our work and our voices so that people, we can share the values of our thoughts and our experiences and, and uh, people can see it on a grander scale because the Western art world does not recognize indigenous art as a faction of the art world.